A startup company believes in its four-legged robot. I'm 100% convinced that this has a future. We just got to make sure we will have a place in this future. Their supporter has a mission. I think it's a very important element that these young people develop from scientists to really entrepreneurs. The CEO of the startup is the only one who has experience as a businessman. You somehow need to dare to go into the unknown, and that's a risk. A risk of failing, which is exactly one specific challenge the startup has to overcome with its robot that moves around on four legs. The name of the robot is Animal. The startup is called Anibotics. This is the new podcast by ETH Zurich. The first four episodes focus on entrepreneurship at ETH on all levels, from student projects to successful spin-offs. I am Jennifer Kakshuri. Chapter 1. What it takes to begin. My name is Hans-Peter Fessler. I'm the executive chairman of Anibotics, and we're now in the offices here at Anibotics in the center of Zurich. We're sitting in the meeting room right next to the open plan office space of the Anibotics team. Around a dozen of young men are working at their computers. Workday life in a startup seems to be pretty unspectacular at first sight. But under the surface, it's quite challenging. Whenever a startup is being founded, the people are always told you need to see the market first and then think about the product. In our case, it's actually to quite some extent the other way around. We have a new product that will open many new options and applications and we're exploring now which applications are the first ones to be used. The new product is a machine with four legs, about the size of a bulldog. It is extremely mobile meaning it can basically walk wherever a human can walk. Over obstacles, through bushes, up and down stairs, and the big advantage... If the robot falls down, it's able to stand up again. This is an important thing, the ability of the machine to stand up. So there should be a market for this four-legged creature. We will talk about who's interested in having a robot animal, but first... Let's quickly look back into the past. The technology for animal uh, was starting in my lab about 10 years ago. And so I'm really still extremely dedicated. I'm following up with all the steps and we're really excited to see how this makes one step after the others to the market. This is Roland Siegwart, one of the pioneers in robotics at ETH. He is co-founder and co-director of V Zurich a joint research and development center of the University of Zurich and ETH. The center was made possible by a $120 million donation from the Swiss entrepreneur and philanthropist Hans-Jörg Wies. Wies Zurich wants to help overcome the so-called Valley of Death. Valley of Death has nothing to do with historical sites or places. It's a common term in the world of startups and indicates the gap between the work of the people in the startup and the income they potentially generate from customers at a later stage of their product. V. Zurich supports promising startups with money and infrastructure in order to bridge the Valley of Death, and Anibotics is one of the promising startups. We need crazy people which really believe to, that this technology will really make it to market and will go over all the risky and really difficult situations. That's what the professor and co-head of V. Zurich says. Hans-Peter, the CEO of Anibotics himself, was once one of those crazy people. 35 years ago, he was the first PhD student in robotics at ETH Zurich. Well, I remember one fellow student when we described the project uh, that we wanted to do with our students, uh, namely a robot playing ping pong. He said, you're crazy. This is never going to work. In the end, it did work. So uh, we were a little bit more adventurous, I would say, than most of our fellow students who were more on the theoretical part in this Institute for Mechanics. Soon after earning a PhD in robotics, he had a successful career in industry and was CEO of two big companies. And then? 
I decided this was the end of corporate life and I was looking for something new. And by chance, more or less, the antibiotics startup idea came along and I decided, yes, this is something now I want to engage myself for the next phase of life. In his 60s, he is by far the eldest of his startup team, more than double the age of most of the men working with him. What I can bring is certainly all the financial know-how, how do you do a business plan, how do you treat customers, how do you write contracts, all the HR aspects, etc. All the non-technical aspects I can cover with uh, some experience uh, that I can bring along from the last few years. On the other hand, he also learns much from people in his team. I had to learn how to work simultaneously, three people at the same time on the same Google document. Just this new way of working, uh, that was part of the learning. And then, of course, I was getting into technology again, but only up to a level where I could understand what we're doing. I'm not the person who is bringing in any technical ideas. That's not my task, and for that, my knowledge is too outdated. Here's someone who has the technical know-how. Peter van Kaiser. I'm a co-founder of Anybotics, and I work as the chief business developer and the software engineer. I did my PhD at ETH in robotics, and during our studies, we had a group of people developing an awesome robot, and we decided uh, to go from research to company, and our group together formed a company, so all of us became co-founders. The basic ideas behind Animal, they all came from ETH. They were developed as part of PhD thesis, uh, master thesis, etc. Uh, about 10 years of research went into that device already. And the end stage was a device that was basically working, but not reliable at all. And we now need to take the step from a device working in principle to a device working repeatedly and reliably and being robust and sturdy. Taking this step sometimes means you have to get over unexpected hurdles. We have to learn how do you first get off of a helicopter which is sinking upside down, how do you get out? This might sound strange, but soon it will make more sense. Chapter 2. What it takes to find customers. There's a product, a walking machine called Animal. It can fulfill inspection or manipulation tasks. Its four legs allow the robot to crawl, walk, run, dance, jump, climb, carry, whatever the task requires. But who in the world needs Animal? Where is the market? Hans-Peter and his team have some ideas and are considering a bunch of fields including agriculture, forestry, railway tracks and even security. Imagine animal as a watchdog. When an intruder wants to enter and a camera probably detects that, then the dog goes out and starts barking. And this would be the animal going out, maybe with a loudspeaker and uh, some message, maybe with a blue light, uh, maybe with some additional sound, a siren or whatever, which I think would be equally impressive to a big dog. Some companies in the field of safety are interested, but Hans-Peter's vision is broader than only that one field. We need to explore in different directions and at the same time still stay focused in order not to diversify too much because we have uh, limited resources. The limited resources are put into the one project at the moment where the hope is high for business, sending animal to offshore platforms. The ones who have signaled a lot of interest are large production companies in the power area that can either be production of electrical power or it is oil and gas companies. And for both of those, especially the offshore applications are very interesting because that's a very, very costly operation for to have people out there and they are interested in maybe complementing the people or even replacing it with a device like Animal. Anybotics is exploring exactly that for a specific electrical power company that owns huge windmill parks in the North Sea. Animal has to prove if it is able to make rounds of control on a converter platform. Peter will be responsible for the test on the platform. That's why he had to perform a sea survival training. And Hans-Peter will observe the mission from Switzerland. Well, what makes me really nervous 
is uh, whether animal will already be able to perform reliably. Chapter 3. Offshore. All right. I'm going to have to talk a little silent because it's already 11.30 here and most of the people, I guess, are asleep. So, hello. Today is the second day on the platform. So, yesterday morning early, we took off from the northern coast of Germany and flew in for roughly 45 minutes towards this platform. When we arrived, I was struck by the size of it, first of all. It's pretty big. It's in area, it's like roughly 80 on 80 meters, and it's got seven levels, so roughly 50 meters high. Um, and it's um, standing on six legs, I think like um, 20 to 30 meters above water. Around it are really tons and tons of windmills, um, that many that you see them up to the horizon. Tomorrow we'll have our first um, autonomous mission where we do inspection, so that's going to be exciting. That's really where we think the value of this robot will come in in the future. I think um, that's it for today. We're all happy, tired, and we're looking forward for the next couple of days. Have a good night. What we didn't know is that they have um, one of their biggest problems is leakage detection. So there is um, many pipes that run here that contain oil, water, cooling water, dirt water, all of it. And they have the problem that these pipes and machines leak, uh, which can cause big damage to the entire platform. So in these cases, Animal would be a great tool to go around and check for leakage because there is right now no fixed installation that can do that. Funny anecdote, actually, Animal found one oil leak during our tests. It was not by inspection, but rather it slipped on it. Um, that's okay because while this is not the most efficient, the operators agreed that they would rather have a robot fall than a human. All in all, I think all of us agree that this week totally fulfilled our expectations. We were able to show autonomous routine inspections over multiple hundred meters that included stairs, various room, and very many different sensor types. Of course, there's still many things that need to be optimized, and we're going home with a long to-do list. Chapter 4. Making the customer happy. We meet Peter and Hans-Peter after the offshore test. I want to know what is on their to-do list now. The robot sometimes needed to take a break to cool down the actuation, uh, especially when climbing stairs, because that's heavy loads on the drives. Plus, they're working on making it run smoothly for many hours to be able to move for a couple of hundred meters. And another thing Animal struggled with was opening doors on the platform. Those doors are very, very heavy. Um, so even a human struggles sometimes to open them. That will be one of the major challenges. Apart from that, if we can equip some of the doors with some electric openers, etc., then I can foresee within the next one or two years, it's absolutely feasible to have a robot there doing remote control or autonomous inspection tasks. For the head of V-Zurich, Roland Siegwart, the platform test is a crucial step in the entire process. For startups, it's extremely important to really be close to a customer and educate and, and see with the customer what you can do. I think this is a wonderful uh, type of applications. Um, I think there is not a lot of risk for animal, but there is probably also a risk that there is some disappointment. That animal cannot do what the customer wants it to do. That's what made Hans-Peter nervous. So how did the customer respond to the offshore test? That reaction is very good. They are looking forward to the second test. They were very happy with the results of the first one. Uh, we're going to have the discussion, how is this going to continue? Because that's not going to be the end of the project. Uh, instead, it's going to be kind of step one in a several years uh, program, I would expect. The end goal is to have an animal robot out on that platform 
and the platform basically being unmanned, at least during uh, periods of time. And for that, of course, we need to be sure that uh, this is working reliably and also uh, over longer term. The first tests on the platform are at least promising, which makes the CEO and business expert Hans-Peter rather confident. There is such an obvious payback. You know, It's so terribly expensive for people to travel out to the platform with the helicopter, etc. Then you have to pay pretty high wages also for people working out there. They have to stay probably a week in a row uh, all the time out there. So it's a very expensive exercise to have people out there. In addition, on other platforms like oil and gas platforms, there's always a risk of explosions. Animal might be a viable solution for that. Therefore, many more companies could be interested. But it should be more than a dream. Whether the market will really adopt at this point in time, and that's the important thing, and it doesn't help us if 10 years down the road Indeed, this is a good solution. We need it to be a good solution now in the next one to two years. Otherwise, we're bankrupt before we reach the 10 years. Uh, so that's still a risk. Uh, we're not really absolutely sure. Which means for Hans-Peter being the CEO of the startup company is not only fun. We're now having 25 people on the payroll. That's a big six-digit monthly amount that goes out. And that has to come in again. And uh, I would say the majority of the responsibility for that is lying on my shoulder, and uh, that uh, creates some pressure. And how does he handle the pressure? Well, probably partly with my experience also. It's not the first time that I'm in, in similar situations. I have some confidence that it will actually work out. I have a feeling for how do we mitigate that risk also, and uh, what would be plan B if it would start to deteriorate. So it's basically by assessing the risk and uh, trying to think about mitigation actions at an early stage. There's one question left. How did the people working on the offshore platform react to Animal? Are they afraid of being replaced by the robot one day? It turned out that they started to like Animal. <laughs> That's probably not quite the same with being replaced by animal, whether they like that or not. It's definitely an issue, I think, that needs to be addressed. To some extent, it's true. I mean, part of the work will be done by animal, but uh, this development uh, towards unmanned operation of these platforms is a, is a kind of a major trend and it will happen anyhow. Roland Siegwart, the pioneer in robotics, doesn't see animal and other robots as competitors for human workforce. No, not at all. I think all the complex and the very interactive jobs will remain for humans. And hopefully the robots will really take the jobs which we don't like. Imagine today robots are really painting or spraying all our cars. Imagine humans would have to do this. This is extremely unhealthy. And so we are happy, I think, to have robots in some applications where there probably is a place for animal, which would lay ground for the success of the startup company of Hans-Peter, Peter and their colleagues. This is the podcast by ETH Zurich. Produced by Tis Wachter's Audio Story Lab and by me, Jennifer Kakshuri. Music, sound design and mastering by Luki Fritz. <laughs>